How you guys doing? Uh, if you guys, if I've never met you, my name is Scott. I am one of the pastors here at this church. I am evidently unprepared. I did not know my stand was going to be that low. Some of you are wondering where George is. George is uh, sick, and also because he went through a whole bunch of stuff recently. And uh, after his mom's uh, memorial, I think his body caught up to him and he had hit him like a ton of bricks. So he's out, sick. He's, uh, he says he's about 60, 70%. So keep him in your prayers. Uh, I've been here for, uh, since the beginning. I'm, I've been here serving at the church since the beginning. A little bit about me. Um, I grew up in L.A. I'm an L.A. boy. How many uh, L.A. people? It's just me. All right. <laughs> Go Dodgers, right? Um, but the, I had an L.A.? Oh, perfect. Perfect. I'm not all alone. One of the things that m my mom used to do all the time is she would take us to Huntington Beach um, during the uh, summer. And this one time, it happened mul multiple times, but the very first time this thing happened to me, it was super traumatic. I went out to play in the water, as kids like to do, and as I'm playing, I'm like diving and punching the waves and, you know, doing all that kid stuff, and I must be out there for 30, 45 minutes, I don't know, and then I finally get hungry, so I'm like, it's time to go back in. I go back in, and my mom is gone. And I start, I'm, you know, at first you're just like, I say, it's cool, it's cool, she's, yeah, she's got to be here someplace. And then I start panicking because she's nowhere to be found, right? And then, like from the recesses of my little kid mind, I hear my mom's voice. We're going to be at Tower 15. What tower are we going to be at? Tower 15, 15, we're at Tower 15, right? So I, I, I had enough, like, wherewithal to be like, okay, Tower 15, I'm at 25. <laughs> so I walk back, and lo and behold, she didn't abandon me. I had just been moved by the current, and I was completely unaware of it. And the reality is uh, if you're anything like me, you've experienced the same thing in life, right? Life has a way. There's a, a current and a pull in this world that tugs on us and moves us even when we're unaware of being moved. And some of you know, right, that sometimes we wake up one day and we realize we're in a relationship that we never should have been in. And you're like, how in the world did I get here? Or you're in a job that's slowly sucking your will to live, right? Or you're trapped and stuck in a sin that you just can't escape. Or you're dealing with constant depression and anxiety. And you look at yourself and you're like, how in the world? I, I used to be in this wonderful spot in life, but somehow I've been moved and transferred. I don't know if you've realized this. All you have to do is ask somebody with either gray hair, no hair, or dyed hair. Life has this really weird way of moving in five to ten year increments. We make these small choices, and then all of a sudden five years have gone by. You make another, and most of the choices don't seem very important at all. You're just like, oh, I'm just going to stick in this job just for a little bit, just until I find something else. And then all of a sudden, 10 years have gone by. And you're like, whoa, what just happened? And this world has a pull on us, and it moves us. And we make these choices, and all of a sudden, we are no longer where we thought we should be. And if you can relate, uh, we have some encouragement for you. 
We're going to be looking at 2 Timothy today, and 2 Timothy has encouragement for us to be diligent not to be pulled, and also several warnings about what happens when we are pulled. So we are actually in a series called Discovering Jesus, and the picture of Jesus in this is basically he is our example, that Jesus is who we should be imitating. The big idea of Timothy is don't be ashamed of suffering for Jesus. 1 Timothy 1.8 says, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel. And I know that just because I said the S word, most of you just tuned out. Suffering. I said suffering. I was expecting more of a laugh on that one, to be honest. I was like, no. All right. Just because we talk about suffering, some people are like, okay. When, whenever it's appropriate, I'm going to sneak out and get some coffee. I'm going to sit out at the tables. I don't want to hear anything about suffering. But don't tune me out. These, First Timothy, or Second Timothy is Paul's last letter, and it's his final words to his spiritual son, like a father trying to impart all of his wisdom before he dies, like, hey, these are the things that are super important in life. Listen to this. Shut up, Siri. These are the things that are super important in life. Listen to me. And this, is, this is Paul's final parting wisdom for us. So there are three good examples in Timothy for, that, that Paul puts out to tell Timothy, hey, these are the examples we should be following. The first one, of course is Jesus, right? As Paul talks about him, he's, he talks about how he died, how he resurrected, and then what he did through that suffering, through that sacrifice, he brought life to others, right? The second example is Paul himself. Paul's example is that he's being poured out as a drink offering, right? It means he's about to die. He, his whole life, is, he is suffering. And the whole pro, point and purpose of his being poured out as a drink offering is to bring, to be a benefit to other people, to bring life to other people. He also talks about that he fought the good fight, that he finished the race, that he kept the faith. Paul has spent his whole life embracing suffering for the benefit of others so that they too could receive life, just like Jesus did. The third example, I have to turn the page so I know how to pronounce this name, is Onesiphorus. And what we're shown about on Onesiphorus is, number one, he's not ashamed of Paul and the suffering. And number two is that he actually seeks Paul out for help, knowing that seeking Paul out could cause him lots of pain and suffering. And you see, even with Onesiphorus, that his whole thing was to embrace difficulty to be a benefit to others, just like Paul, just like Jesus. And this is the example that he brings to him. The commonality of all three. What's the commonality of all three? What do you guys think? Suffering. But is it just suffering, just to suffer? It's about sacrificing themselves so that they could bring life to others. It's the commonality of all three, Jesus, Paul, and Onesiphorus. That they embrace suffering for themselves so that they could bring life to other people. Paul, throughout the book, tells Timothy, be like those three guys. These are just a few of the imperatives or commands that Paul gives, right? 
He says, stir up your gifts. Don't be fearful. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Hold fast to good doctrine. Be strong in God's grace. Endure hardships. Be diligent to present yourself approved. Be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Right? Paul's saying, just like Jesus did, just like I am, just like this other guy is, you need to do the same thing. You need to embrace this idea, Timothy. Not only are there good examples, he also brings out three bad examples, three pairs of people. The first one, Phygelus and Hermogenes, and they turned away. By the way, when you see, just to give you like a heads up as you're reading the Bible, and there's like crazy names you don't know how to pronounce, just like be bold and say something, because nobody else knows how it's pronounced either. And they'll be like, oh, really? I didn't know that's, that's how you say it. I didn't even write that one down, right? You, you just be bold, and everybody will be like, wow, it's a good one. So these two turned away from Paul, and the reason why they turned away is because they were ashamed of the suffering he went through, and they didn't want to be associated with that suffering or suffer themselves. So they turned away from Paul and walked away from him. And Paul says, don't be like those two doubts. Doubts. Uh, Hymenaeus and Philetus, these guys strayed from the truth, which is bad doctrine. Right? The, they started believing stuff that just wasn't true. And by the way, one way to avoid straying from the truth is to sign up for the Bible study class. If you look at your Bible and you're like, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do with this thing, it's a great idea just to get the basics so that you yourself, as you're reading the Bible, don't stray from the truth. There's lots of crazy people out there that think the Bible teaches a lot of crazy things because they don't know how to study it. And you can do, you will either stray or the second thing will happen to you is because of their error, they, they, they pulled others from the faith. Right? Timothy actually says that because people don't know what the Bible teaches, uh, we look for people that tell us what we want to hear. And so it's important to know what the Bible teaches, and it's important to know how to do it yourself. So sign up for the Bible study class if you haven't done it. Then the other people is Janus and Jambres, Jambres, and they resisted the truth. Notice there's an interesting progression up there. The first thing that Paul talks about is people turning away from the difficult things of the gospel. Like, ooh, that's tough. I just want the grace and the love, and I don't want to actually do anything hard. And then the next thing is you see people straying from the truth and also causing other people to stray. And then eventually what happens is you outright resist the truth. Right? When we, and that's just the basic, the pull that we talked about, you start turning away from things that you don't like and you start moving in a direction that eventually you will be outright resisting the truths of God and be like, no, 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 that is wrong, that is bad, that is evil, no thank you, I did not sign up for this. And Paul's whole point is, don't be like these people. These guys you do not want to be like. Timothy, let's look at a closer look at one of the imperatives. It says, you, Timothy, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Paul is commanding Timothy to emulate all these good these good examples, right? What does it mean to be strong in the grace? That's an odd term. Like, nobody ever says that. It's almost like something Yoda would say, right? What does it mean to be strong in the grace? So when I ask questions, I like answers. What do you guys think? What does that mean? 
So if you don't, yeah, you have to understand the grace of God in order to stand strong. Any other guesses? Practice it, okay. Yes. Hold on to it. So it, it's basically an imperative to te- that tells us to keep being empowered by God. That's the, that's, draw your power from God and His grace, Timothy. Stand strong. Get your source of uh, vivification through God's grace. Staying strong, being empowered by God requires continuous, continuous, active cooperation with God. I'll say that again because that was a big one. Even I stumbled over it. Staying strong in God's grace requires continuous, active cooperation with God. You don't just wake up and be like, I am empowered today. I feel the power. Right? We have to actually partner with God and be strong in it. It's something that we need to pursue. If not, if we don't pursue being empowered by God, guess what happens? You begin to drift away from it. That's why, that's why like Timothy, we need to be reminded to be empowered by God. It's something that we need to actively pursue. How long has it been since you've felt empowered by God? Has it been a minute? Because the reality is if you're not pursuing it, you will pursue something else. Our lives are filled with stuff that's demanding our attention all the time. And if we're not pursuing being empowered by God, something else, we will just pursue something else. We can either keep on track or we can be taken off of track, right? Are you on track today? There's three metaphors that Paul finishes. So he says, be strong in the grace, and then he gives three metaphors. This verse up here is what he says after all three metaphors, right? It says, consider what I say. And may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Basically, he's saying, I just dropped some nuggets on you. You need to really like think about what I said because it's kind of important. Spend some time. It's like once Timothy got to that thing, Paul wanted him to put his thing down and just be like, wow, that was, that was deep. Right? So here are the three metaphors. The first one is the soldier. It says, youth, therefore, must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier, right? So, you have to, the, a soldier needs to do what, according to this? Therefore, you as a good soldier, you have to do what? Endure hardship, right? How many uh, military, former, current, present military do we got here? We got one, two, we got a few. What is the hardship you have to endure as a soldier? Yeah. But the big one is once you sign on a dotted line, you are no longer yourself. You are no, you, somebody else owns you. Right? Somebody else owns you. And the hardship a, sh- a soldier has to endure is that they no longer are allowed to entangle themselves in all of the affairs of this life. You can't just go home anytime you want. Right? There are restrictions. And it also says 
that when someone is engaged in warfare, he shouldn't entangle himself in the affairs of this world. Why would you not want to, in, if you're engaged in war, why would you not want to be entangled in the affairs of this world? Two things. Number one, if you are obsessed with your life and your family and all that stuff, you will either be a danger to yourself or you will be a danger to the people around you. And if you want to be a good soldier, you have to understand that there's certain things that I just cannot go to anymore or else I become entangled. And the whole reason you don't entangle yourself is what? What does it say? That you may do what? Please the one who enlisted you. Right? You want to please your commanding officer. That you endure hardships of not entangling yourself in life so you can please your commanding officer. It's the first metaphor. Second metaphor is the athlete. The athlete says, and also if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Right, this is the second metaphor, which basically it says, if you want to run a race and you want to have a chance at winning, what do you have to do? Well, it doesn't talk about training. It's assuming that you train. What does it say? You have to follow the rules. There are rules that you must follow in order to win a race. Right? There are no shortcuts. You cannot just make up your own rules. If you go to, so I'm just m making a general guess here. None of us are elite athletes that if we run in a marathon, we even have a shot. Okay? But even if you don't have a shot and you get the participation tr prize, if they found out you broke the rules, would they give you your participation trophy? No, even for last place, they'd be like, sorry, you cheated. You cheated, sorry, too bad. You will be judged according to how well you ran within the rules that are set before you. Life is a race. The Bible is a metaphor for life is a race. Our life of faith is a race. There are rules that we have to abide by. We don't get to make up our own, unfortunately. And if we do not run the race according to the rules set before us, we cannot even place in the race. We will be disqualified. The third metaphor is the farmer. This is the one where it gets a little bit better. It's like, like I talk about the soldier and you're like, endure hardship, great. I have to run a race and it's, other people are telling me what to do. Great. This one's good. The hardworking farmer must be the first to partake of the crops. All right. So let's just, I know none of us like grow stuff anymore. Uh, <laughs> we are not farmers. How long does it take to, um, like corn, how long does it take to go from planting to reaping? Couple days, right? Couple weeks? Months. You're talking months. There's months of you're working hard for months, and what are you seeing for months? Nothing. Right? This is the, this is the hard work, but after you put in all the hard work, what happens? Eventually, there is a crop, and who gets to be? the first person to receive the fruit of their labor, the farmer. And the same is true for us, that, that this walk of faith is a lot of hard work, but guess what there is in the end? There's a reward for you to enjoy. 
It's, ne- it's not about this, I have to give up on life and give all this stuff up and I'm running this race for no benefit. That you, the hardworking farmer, works hard because there is a benefit at the end. Right? So, the metaphors, the soldier doesn't entangle himself in, the, in order to please his commanding officer. Right? God, Jesus, is our commanding officer. In this race of life, there is no shortcuts. And you do not get to make up the rules. But if you stay, stay strong and persist, there is a reward that is worth it. These three metaphors are contrasted in Timothy by not-so-bueno stuff. It says, but now this, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, blasphemers, disobedience to parents. I read that one to my kids all the time. Unthankful unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. They have a form of godliness, but there is no power to their godliness. This is an interesting verse. It says, in the last days will be perilous. Perilous is another term for dangerous. Why are these last days so dangerous? Because this describes the church. This is the world. You name it, this is the world. The days will be perilous because these will be believers. This is not a list of people who don't love God. This is a list of people who say they do love God. But the world has pulled them so far from who He is that this is now who they are. That they are lovers of themselves. And that's why they turn away from the hard things. That's why we turn away from the hard things. Because we're lovers of ourselves. We're good at it. That that comes natural. You don't have to teach a child to be selfish. Right? And if we don't stay strong, we will drift to loving ourselves. If we're not actively trying to be like the soldier, the athlete, or the farmer, this is what we become. But there's a solution. Timothy says, or Paul says, in a great house, which is referring to God's house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor, right? A vessel of honor would be Okay, so I don't know, like nobody does this anymore, but my mom had china. And every Sunday after church, we would break out the good china and eat dinner. Anybody, like your parents, is my the only one that had china? Those are vessels of honor. These are something special that we only take out on on the, like, bring out the good glasses. Like, you have friends over, you're not drinking out of the plastic glasses. You're like, get the good glasses, right? That there are vessels of honor that you use for special occasion. What would be a vessel of dishonor? (laughs) Yes. Think about what a vessel of honor would be before the advent of plumbing. It's a bedpan. (laughs) Right? And what they would do, instead of there were no outhouses because they lived in cities and stuff, you would just (laughs) and throw it out. There are, (laughs) I'm sorry, I saw this TikTok video, I was going to, some lady, (laughs) I can't, I can't, 
Like, all I know, all I could say was a thermometer dipped in Nutella, and it's a prank on her husband. It was funny. You should see it. That would be a vessel of dishonor, right? So the rectal thermometer is a dishonor. The oral one is honor. You get what I'm saying. Get back on track. It's okay. We're, I'm going someplace. Don't worry. So, if you, and then it goes on, so there's honor and dishonor. Therefore, verse 21, if anyone cleanses himself or herself of the latter, being in a vessel of dishonor, they will become a vessel of honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Paul says the difference between the metaphors and the, the warning is that the metaphors, you are cleansing yourself of things that are dishonorable in your life. What are some of the dishonorable things that Timothy talks about? Loving yourself to the point that you're ashamed of suffering. Another one would be the bad doctrine. Right, and what I mean by that is bad doctrine that gives you excuse to sin. It's okay. It's cool. The Bible is written in a different time. It's totally fine. Or being self-serving. These attitudes reveal a misunderstanding of God's kingdom. Right? What we do as human beings, we do an ROI, right? The, your, your return on your investment in our head, and we're like, ah, that's a lot, I'm not really getting much out of it, no thank you God, I'm going to stick with my plans. And instead of doing that, we, we need to become a vessel of honor useful for the master. The good news is, if today the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you, and you're like, ooh, I've drifted. The good news is you don't have to stay that way. One of my favorite sayings is you can only be tomorrow what you're becoming today. So the question is, what are you becoming today? Are you becoming a vessel of dishonor? that's useful for only yourself, or are you becoming a vessel of honor that is useful for not only for God, but a blessing to the people around you? See, there is an upside-down kingdom. God's kingdom appears upside-down to us. The reality is His is the right side up and ours is upside-down. But it's completely, it's, it's antipodal, right? Polar opposites. God's kingdom and our kingdom are Polar opposites. Paul says this is a faithful saying. For if we died with him, we will what? Live with him. The next one is if we endure, what do we get? We get to reign. How many of you guys want to be healthy in your life? Like healthy, like physically healthy, right? I just turned 51. I am trying to be very healthy. I've got very small kids. My daughter is seven years old, which means when she's 30, I'm going to be pushing 80, right? So I'm like, oh, I really need to like get on top of it because <laughs> I want to hold, I want to hold my grandbabies, and I want to be healthy enough to hold my grandbabies, right? And so I'm on this real big kick to try and get as healthy as possible. But you realize that being healthy requires, it's the crazy, it's like a, it's a total scam. It's a fraud. It's a scam, right? They tell you like exercising gives you energy, but you need energy to exercise. That's a pyramid scheme. <laughs> that is a pyramid scheme, Right? And it's just crazy. You have to hurt yourself in order to get healthy. You, you honestly do. You have to stress your body to the point where it's like, whoa, what are you doing? And then it begins to heal itself and gets better. 
And we get that about exercise. Right? It's crazy. If you look at all-cause mortality, if you've got a high uh, VO2 max or um, really good cardio, you have a three, 300 times lower um, chance of all-cause mortality if you've got amazing cardio. Right? Average somebody with bad cardio, someone with good cardio, the guy that's going to die 300 times more likely to die is the guy with bad cardio. You know the only problem with uh, cardio is? It's the cardio part. That's really, that's really the only downside. If you are buff, your all-cause mortality is 200 times, right? So if you got good cardio and you're buff, you got 500 times more likely to live longer than somebody that doesn't. It's pretty impressive, right? You've got lower cases of cancer. You've got lower cases of heart disease. There's lower cases of Alzheimer's. Like, it's a, like the benefits are extraordinary. But in order to get those benefits, what do you have to do? Pain. <laughs> Pain is required. And we get that with our health, but we don't really get that with our spirituality. If you give your life what does God give you back? He gives you his life. It's, a, it's a, incredible. If you give your life, you will actually save the thing that's most important to you, just like Jesus did. He gave his life, and he gave life. But, what's the next part? This is where it gets like, ooh. There's some verses you're just like, man, I wish I didn't say that. If you deny him, I know nobody wants to read it. <laughs> if you deny him, what does it say? He will deny you. If you turn away from him, he will turn away from you. If you're like, oh, man, that whole being spiritually working out thing is like, no thanks. He will say, no thanks to you as well. If you try to save your life, you will lose it. It's like trying to get healthy by, watching, by binge watching Netflix and eating Ben and Jerry's. It's what it's like. Spiritually, it's like I'm going to get totally spiritually buff by living for myself and not embracing the difficult things of the gospel. If you approach it like that, you are walking, turning away, and he will turn away from you. But here's the good part. Even when we are unfaithful, so you're never going to be perfect. I don't know if anybody's told you that yet. You will never be perfect. I will never be perfect. You will screw up. But even when we screw up, what are we told? He's faithful. Even when we drop the ball, he is still faithful to us. We will mess up and fall short. The world will pull us and will drift. But even in those mess ups, God remains faithful to you. Like me personally, anytime I go through trials, I like go down in flames for at least a month, two months, right? I make all kinds of bad decisions, check out mentally, gorge myself on food like a, like a cow that's getting fattened for slaughter, <laughs> Right? I, when, when times get tough, I go into self-protection mode. But even then, even when I'm making the wrong decisions, God's still faithful to lead me through the difficulty and help me, even though I've strayed, to put me back to where I need to be. So how do you fight against the current of life? 
The application. Number one, you have to be on guard. The second you step out, there's a pull on you constantly. For some of you, your phones have been pulling on you even while we're here. Right? You have to be on guard against this idea of comfort at all costs. There, realize there's nothing wrong with comfort. Right? I'm happy we got soft, squishy seats. There's a reason nobody sits here. <laughs> I'm not sure why people don't sit here. Right? You look at these things. I mean, look at these. I mean, it's cool. Right? That's cool. But you look at these and you're like, ah, where is the soft seat? There's nothing wrong with comfort, but here's the deal. There is a point when comfort can become your enemy. And it begins to actually derail your life. So you have to be on guard against comfort at all cost. You have to be on guard against compromise. My life has demonstrated something over and over, and I know yours has as well. A small yes eventually leads to a big yes. Small compromises will eventually lead to big compromises. Right? And then you're in your big compromise, and you're like, oh my gosh, how did I get here? And you're like, it was all those little tiny yeses I said first. And we have to be on guard against compromises. Compromises in our relationships. Compromises in our escape behaviors. Drinking drugs, uh, video games, shopping. Like there's a billion escape behaviors. And the big question that you should ask yourself is, does your life benefit, besides yourself, who does your life benefit? Right? And if you're married or have kids, you cannot answer your spouse or your kids. Because basically, you're a horrible person if you're not benefiting them. <laughs> right? That's just like, if you are not being a benefit to your spouse you will get a divorce soon. If you're not being a benefit to your kids, eventually they will stop talking to you. Like, you're a horrible person if that's not, like, one of your, like, oh, benefit. so they don't count. Besides yourself, who does your life benefit? Right? And if your job requires you to be a benefit, that doesn't count either because you're getting paid for it. So we have to be on guard, and the next thing is to embrace self-sacrifice. Introduce things into our lives that cost us but benefit other people. Introduce things that require me to stop doing what I'm doing, focusing on me, and focus on somebody else to benefit them. Right? The examples that Paul talked about in 1 Timothy or 2 Timothy is Jesus. He died in order to benefit other people. Paul, he gave up his life in order to benefit other people. <coughs> we should be doing the same thing. And there's a, opportunities for you to do this. Right? An easy opportunity is serving here at church. Right? Super simple. If you want, if you're like new to church and you're like, man, I wish I could meet people, best place to serve is on the food team once a month. You'll, you'll literally meet every single person in church. Right? Or the welcome team. Or any team. Just start serving. We have this mentality as Americans that we are just such consumers. We come to consume. Give me something, give me something, give me something, give me something, give me something. Do you think that would fall into the bad category or the good category? The bad category. We need to change our minds about when we come to church. Come to bless other people. Sit with somebody that looks like they don't know anybody. 
realize there's challenges and hardships sitting all around you in this room that you know nothing about, and they need help. They need people to listen to them. They need people to pray for them. Right? But so often, I'm going to pick on myself because I know that you guys are, I'm more concerned like, can this line move faster so I can get my food? <laughs> uh, I don't want to sit there. That's in the sun. It's hot today. Right? There's people that are going through stuff that need your help. Man, Monday is a great idea. If you're a guy, come next week, but come to bless. Us men, we've got this thing that we suffer in silence. That's our thing. There's people showing up with struggling marriages, addictions, discouragements. Show up to places to be a blessing, not just to be like, oh, I didn't like that sermon. The worship was so... Oh, we're doing sandwiches again? Why do we always have to eat sandwiches? <laughs> right? Show up to, to give something, not just to receive something. Another thing that you can do, I know that we never talk about this in church because George has issues with it, <laughs> is give your money. I, if you're new, you probably have caught on. We don't like put bags in front of your faces because we want you to give out of the abundance of your heart, not because somebody's like forcing you to. But realize one of the most profound things you can do to help sacrifice yourself is give some of your hard-earned money to bless people, right? If you're like old school, there's, I don't even know where it is. There's like things that you can, they're here someplace, or you can give online. But honestly, consider what do you what do you give of your resources? Give of your time, give of your talent, and give of your treasure. And at work, what can you do at work to bless somebody? Right? Even that weird one, that weird person that you avoid, how can you help them? How can you bless them? The world has been tugging at all of us. You can come up telling us that we are the most important thing, right? Telling us to promote our happiness, prioritize that thing. And realize that there's nothing wrong with being happy, but doing it at the detriment of other people is no bueno. Paul's a, Paul tells us to do something different. Don't let the world move you. Be strong. Stay focused on the heart of the gospel. Right? Jesus died to bring life. Our lives should reflect that same sentiment. That there should be self-sacrifice to be a blessing to other people. What is one sacrifice that you can make this week to be a blessing? Because if we really want to live, if we want to live and experience the life, the, that abundant life Jesus promised, we need to give of ourselves. Now, I know that uh, we're about to pray. So go ahead, close your eyes. I know this room is, and even outside, there's people in here that's drifted. You've made choices that you're like, dang, I'm so far. I'm not where I, I, I should be. And I want to pray for you right now. And so if that's you, if you're like, man, the world's been tugging and I need to, I need to be more focused. I need to be strong. I just want you to raise your hand right now. Nobody else will see. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. Father, we come before you and we just ask that you would help us. Help us to remember what's truly important in life. It's easy to talk ourselves into that we are the most important thing. 
and to prioritize ourselves above all others, Lord. We ask that you would help us be like the soldier. That we would endure hardships or certain things we just can't entangle ourselves in, Father, so that we could please you. We pray that you would cause us to be like the athlete and run with purpose and not cut corners, Father. And I pray that you would give us the perspective of the farmer. And that we do all this hard work, not because we're gluttons for punishment, but because there's a reward for us. And that we would receive the very thing that we want the most, which is our life. And we trust you that that is true, Lord. We trust you with our hearts. We trust you with our lives. Let's all stand. And if... If the world, if it's been a while and the world's been tugging at you and you're like, oh my gosh, I've been so, so gone for so long, I want to encourage you you might, it might be a great opportunity to get baptized. To be like, you know what, God, I want to make a fresh statement in my life. And I'm going to stand for you.